for um, the introduction and the invitation. It's wonderful to be with you all. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing some of uh, the history of the last decade in Rio and actually going back a lot further um, and also hearing your questions. So let's get to it. I'll go ahead and show my slides. I, I shared the link to the slides in the chat. So if any of you wanna follow along, you can. And also something I always do with my talks is I include a lot of slides, a lot of images, because obviously I'm going to be talking about a place that probably um, very few of you have been to. And so this way you can get a picture for what um, these communities look like, what the city of Rio looks like, and also the work that our organization does. Um, and also there's a lot of text and whenever there's a text slide, I probably won't be going through it in a lot of detail. So you can look at it later and please feel free to email me. You can see my email address here at the bottom and the presentation, like I, I shared the link, it's also available online. So the presentation I'm doing today is called Mega Events and Rapid Urban Change in the Divided City. Rio is known as Cidade Partida, the Divided City because of the severe inequality there. Um, this is a picture of, of the Hacinha, the largest favela in the city of Rio. Um, so I'm gonna divide my talk into a couple different sections. First, I'm actually gonna, before we talk about the Olympics or the last decade at all, I'm gonna talk about the history, um, a bit of the history of the city and that generated the favelas and what favelas, um, some of the, you know, the, the elements that uh, led to their formation. And then I'm going to give you a sense of what these communities are today from our organization, Catalytic Communities perspective. And I will tell you a little bit about our organization, Catalytic Communities, also so you get a framework for what, why we think the way we do about favelas. Um, but then I'm going to talk to you about um, the Olympics, that period before the Olympics, what happened in the city, how instructive it was for, uh, for how we understand what's happening. Um, and what, what, what has always happened, to be honest, but is now has become really visible through the Olympics and now COVID as well. They've exacerbated a lot of the inequalities that have been there historically. And then I'll talk about how communities have responded to all of this, some of the keys to successful resistance by favela communities. So it's important just to get a quick backdrop to the city of Rio, especially how that history affects the favelas. When people think of Rio, they think of the images of, you know, that you would see in a tourist brochure, tourism brochure with the Sugarloaf Mountain and the Christ the Redeemer and the beaches. Um, but very few people know the history of the city is actually permeated with um, the history of colonialism and slavery, very deeply embedded. Even people in Rio are not widely aware that the city was actually the largest slave port in history. Uh, the city of Rio actually received five times more enslaved Africans than the entire United States during slavery. Um, and because slavery in Brazil lasted 60% longer, you can imagine uh, the legacy this has left. And it, it actually permeates everything in the culture, but very few people talk about it, think about it. Uh, it's just sort of conditioned into um, everything. And the first favela is a product of that. So slavery was abolished in 1888, very late. And within a decade, the first favela community was settled. Um, and the story of the first favela was called Favela Hill at the time. Um, today it's called Providencia. And it was named after this spiny, robust plant you can see here in the top right, um, which was characteristic of the hillsides where former enslaved Brazilians had served battle. They were recruited into the army in the 1890s, um, the Brazilian army to fight this rebellion. And it was a very bloody war. They were told that when the war was over, they would be paid with land. So they came to the capital city of Rio to get their payment. They didn't receive their payment. And they were told, well, just you can squat on that hill. And they did. So they created the first favela and they called it Favela Hill after this plant. So the word favela doesn't have any negative pejorative, you know, uh, connotation inherently. Um, it's it's um, not an objectively negative term. Um, and there were elements, you know, besides the abolition of slavery, Brazil had some of the worst land inequality in the world. Rio was the capital of the country. There was no policy of affordable housing in the late 1800s. And so people came to Rio looking for um, jobs and 
They settled wherever there was public land and much of that was on the hillsides near the city center. So the first favelas were settled around the hillsides and then later on in outlying low-lying areas. And now over 123 years, we've seen basically policies of neglect and repression, neglect and repression. Um, it's easy to think of neglect as the absence of policy, but actually neglect is a very active policy. And uh, that's what we've experienced mostly towards favelas throughout their history with a few exceptions. Um, and I would, I would say most notably the period from 1988 to about 2008, there was a 20 year window where we saw some significant um, improvements. We had adverse possession, which is squatters rights in the constitution. Um, favelas were upgraded. Many hundreds of favelas in Rio were actually received improvements. Um, there was a federal welfare program that helped take Brazil off the world hunger map and affirmative action policies helped young people get access to universities. But we've seen in this last period of, of 10 years after, with basically when the Olympics was announced. So in 2009, Rio um, was selected to host the 2016 Olympics and it was also gonna host the 2014 World Cup final. So there was going to be this huge period of investment in the city. And you would have expected that, that in theory, that investment would have benefited people in the favelas. But what I'll show later is that it didn't. Um, and so we and and we've had other regressions as well. So again, just put in a different format. You can see here sort of policies from 123 years ago till now, essentially of regret reg neglect and repression towards favelas. However, and this is really important, residents are still there, right? This is policies. This is what the government is doing. Now, what are people doing? So the residents, they build and they rebuild and they rebuild their communities. And that's what they're focused on this entire time. And so as a product of this, today we have about a thousand favelas in Rio and they host 20, 24% of the city's population. They range in size from tens to 200,000 people, which is the one I showed on that first slide with all the lights, uh, Hosinga. And most favela residents live in communities that are over 50 years old. So we're talking about established neighborhoods. These are no longer precarious slums. And we'll talk about that in a second. So they're all over the city. You can see the oranges and the reds on this map. They're literally everywhere, which is different also from other cities in the world where low-income neighborhoods and informal settlements tend to be on the fringes. In Rio, they're all over the city. Here's, some, here's a favela in the south, heart of the south zone, in the heart of the north zone, and across the city. So now I'm gonna sort of take the other perspective. So from what's happening on the inside, while that neglect and repression is happening by the government, what are communities building? Let's reintroduce favelas from that perspective. And it's a very important perspective because when we think about it, um, a third of people living in cities today live in informal settlements. 85% uh, of housing around the world is actually built illegally. And by 2050, the United Nations predicts one third of all humanity will live in informal settlements. So uh, we need to pay attention to these communities because this is where human population growth is happening in our lifetimes particularly in Africa and Asia, where countries are still urbanizing. In Latin America, urbanization happened decades ago. So the favelas are pretty constant now and they're pretty consolidated. Um, but in Africa and Asia, you have a lot of new communities, which would be slums or squatter communities that are quite new and precarious. So learning from Latin America and Rio especially is critical and we have an option. Are we going to continue seeing these areas as a blight, right? A problem that has to be solved, something that should never exist? Or are we just going to recognize that they're part of how cities evolve? And how do we take advantage of the qualities that actually do get developed by residents in these settlements? So when you stop and just say straight up, what are favelas? What do all the favelas in Rio, what do the thousand favelas in Rio all have in common? Well, it's not crime. Not all favelas have crime. It's not lack of land titles. Some favelas get land titles over time. It's actually simply their initial blueprint, how they develop. They're neighborhoods that develop as a solution to the unmet need for housing. So people need shelter, 
and they have no other options, so they build it themselves. There's no outside regulation, so the government isn't telling them what to do. And that means they can be incredibly interesting, creative places, or they can be incredibly dysfunctional, um, unsafe places. But those, it's not predestined that a favela is, um, is a place that is um, uh, unsuitable, for example, to live. Very much on the contrary, when people evolve, develop, develop them over time and invest in them, they can become vibrant communities. They're built by residents for residents, so there's no outside speculator coming in and building housing. That means that everything you see in all the pictures I show you were built by residents. Somebody in that community, somebody's grandfather, grandmother, brother, cousin, put in the pipes, put in the tiles, put in the bricks. So the embedded history in favela communities is really an incredible force. And you can see in this picture here, um, a, a system, a sewage system being put in by residents themselves, which actually the government later on decided was good, good and as good as the government was gonna do. And so they incorporated it into the formal system. And finally, favelas constantly evolve based on culture, access to resources, jobs, knowledge, the city. So they're really diverse. So a favela on a hillside will be very different than a favela in a low-lying area. A favela in the heart of the south zone near the tourist opportunities around tourism will be very different from the post-industrial north zone. If a favela is settled um, during the 60s, they're going to have very different characteristics to one settled in the 90s. And the leadership that establishes that community is critical as well in its ultimate outcome. So all of these things, right, and the communities are evolving day to day, week to week. So not only are favelas different across neighborhoods, but they're different in themselves. You can visit the same favela two weeks apart and have a different experience in that space. Um, it, they're incredibly vibrant. And so whereas they start as squatters or shanty towns or shacks or slums, um, they actually evolve out of those conditions. And unfortunately, when we translate to English, people still use those terms when it really makes sense to just call them favelas. So over time, they become consolidated, where the building stock, access to some services, community ties, and a way of life become firmly established. And when that happens, residents want to stay. And so that's the easiest way to know if it's a consolidated favela. Ask people there if, they're, if they have a sense of belonging and want to stay in their community. And typically, favelas that are more established have that very strong. Um, so said another way, favelas are affordable housing, informal, self-built and unique. And they're solutions factories. Rather than thinking them as a pro an inherent problem, we should be thinking them as a factory of solutions. It starts with shelter. People are addressing the need for shelter and then they move on to trying to address other basic needs. And sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. Um, it's very hard when you're working against all odds and obstacles imposed through policies of neglect and repression. So focusing specifically on the need for shelter, right? Um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, which is a basic uh, framework used in psychology. If you look at the, the very basic needs that we need to survive and which are required for us to achieve all the other needs that we have, um, they are air, food, water, shelter, right? Clothing, sleep, the physiological needs at the base of the pyramid. And I like to use this version of the pyramid to talk about this because it makes explicit the difference between shelter, which is a physiological need that we have to survive, and property, which is a safety security need, one rung up. And unfortunately, in our housing policies around the world for the last decades, we've been conflating those things and making housing into a speculative good rather than understanding that it's first and foremost there to meet a need. And this is, um, there's a 20% rule uh, in, you know, you can see this apply in cities around the world. I'm sure it's the same in Vienna. Um, at least 20% of the population of any city can't afford market rate housing. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, this will apply. Sometimes it's much higher actually, but it's at least 20%. Why? Because the, the private market is, it won't make money, right? Off of the expensive land and construction and so on. Um, they won't be able to, the people in the lowest income strata will not be able to afford that. And so the only way to address that, again, very basic need of shelter, it's not a negotiable, is to provide other 
um, other form, forms of access to housing. And so you might have cooperatives um, in the, through a nonprofit, you might have government provide public housing or social rent or rent stabilization or inclusionary zoning, which is common in some parts of the United States. Um, but in the developing world, uh, it's favelas, it's informal settlements, it's people, civil society informally responding to the need for shelter. It's not a coincidence that 20 to 24% of Rio's favelas, um, Rio's population lives in favelas. And going back to the very beginning of my talk, um, you know, this is a racial map of Rio and there is a, it's almost a blueprint of the favela map. You can see um, even in the south zone, the wealthy areas near the beachfront where you see black and brown Cariocas, local Brazilians from Rio, is in the favelas. Um, it's, 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 so that legacy is very much present. And ultimately, favelas are a territorial manifestation of that legacy of slavery, very present today. Now, again, there are qualities that Rio's favelas have from their self, you know, self-built development over time. Um, they can be quite humane, livable communities. Um, in some cases, they provide affordable housing in central areas, efficient and responsive architecture. So, you know, this, these houses here, everything in this picture was built by residents, except for the electric cables, everything else, the curbs, the sidewalk, the street, the sewage system, the housing. Um, and they often build it together in Muchirong. Muchirong is when they do collective action projects, everybody gets together to build. Um, but the houses themselves, they'll evolve over time. You know, somebody will buy a shack, they'll, they'll move in, they'll improve the materials of that shack over time, their child will be born, they'll add a room, their child will grow up, they add a floor for their child to live with their kids. Um, you know, they'll, maybe they, they lose their job, they move upstairs and start a shop below. Um, maybe they need extra income, they add a floor to rent out. Maybe they want some leisure space, they add a rooftop terrace. So favela housing is actually <clears throat> incredibly responsive, which is almost the polar opposite of public housing. Um, <clears throat> so there are sociocultural assets of favelas. Um, you know, when you think about culture in Rio, <clears throat> whether it's street art or samba or uh, the latest dance form, pasingo, um, all of these are produced or maintained or strengthened in favelas, whether it's carnival, um, New Year's Eve, uh, capoeira, and so on. There are urbanistic and economic qualities of favelas. Um, this is a study from 2014 that is outdated now, but it's instructive. Um, it was at the end of the economic boom in Brazil where they found that over the previous decade, average wage in favelas had increased 55% rather than 38%, which was the national average. Uh, favelas had more middle-class residents than Brazil as a whole. 95% of 4% of them considered themselves happy. Um, and so, you know, this is very much against what we think of when we think of favelas, right? In the international media, oh, favelas are slums, favelas should be removed, they should be given better housing. The truth is that over time, people invest and improve their communities, and what they really want is for their communities to be integrated fully into the city and provided with the services that they now have the right to. Um, and what we found in our work is that favelas whose residents take advantage of the qualities of informality, basically the ability to realize their own improvements, but also fight for access to services and rights, they seem to make the greatest development inroads over time. I'll show you a few pictures now of different favelas. This is Providencia, again, the very first favela today. This is Hosinha, that largest favela I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you can see the level of public infrastructure is pretty significant in this picture. Uh, and you can contrast that with Indiana in this picture where there's no public infrastructure to speak of. Um, you know, there's issues with electric utility, which is provides subpar service in favelas. The water utility, which for the most part leaves residents to build their own systems and connect them to the formal grid, but that is hugely problematic. Um, but then you get, you know, creative design and you get a huge amount of social interaction, uh, people taking over street space, it's totally fine, everybody does it. Um, people create, you know, have very strong social ties. Um, and there's a limited amount of public space, but there is some public space in favelas. And again, the whole idea of cultural preservation, strong solidarity ties and close-knit communities. 
So before going on to the next section, I just wanted to show this slide because it's important in the pre-Olympic period to understand that there's, there's this difference between the formal city, right, and the informal city. Um, when the mayor of Rio during the pre-Olympic years, who I'll talk about in a, a few minutes, when he um, took office, he made formalizing the favelas one of his goals. He, he, this was about a decade ago. He was, he was insistent that what favelas was basically was the lack of the formal, right? If you simply bring them formal instruments, if you uh, for, make the businesses formalized, if you make them um, make sure they're paying, you know, they pay their property taxes, you give them land titles, all of some of these things sound excellent, right? We can problematize them later. But basically, if you give them these things, right, if you make them pay for the electricity and water and make sure everybody's connected, that's what's missing in the favelas. But before we actually think about this, we have to understand they're, they're, it's not that the informal city is the lack of the formal, it's that they're actually two di different ways of life. So when we think about formalizing informal, we need to take into account the qualities that exist in the informal um, approach to city building. So for example, a formal city regulation limits the complexity of, of the environment. So you can't you, everything is very rigid and structured. In the informal city, the lack of regulation actually leads to increasing complexity. Increasing complexity can be a good thing for city building because you get more spontane spontaneity, more innovation. Um, it can be a very positive thing. Financial and bureaucratic barriers to entry in the formal city, right? But in the informal city, if you're low income, you know, you don't depend on financial uh, monet, you know, monetize services. You can demonetize your services. You can provide mutual support. You can self-build your home. So you don't rely so much on a larger income. Um, the centralized planning versus the iterative planning, the urbanistic freedom in the informal settlements. Um, and then the logic of privacy in the formal city versus the proximity of the favelas and the high degree of collective action. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk a bit more about this later. Before we go on to talking about the Olympics uh, specifically, I want to mention a little bit about our organization. Um, so I founded Catalytic Communities. It's a nonprofit based in Rio 21 years ago. I'm originally from Brazil, but at the age of six, I moved to the United States and then I moved back to Brazil 21 years ago. Um, our organization basically serves um, to support community organizers in favelas with the intention of creating models for effective community-led integration with the formal city. For the first decade of work, <clears throat> we are focused mostly on networking local leaders across communities and using the internet. We had a community center, we had a website that was multilingual where solutions were shared. This was before the internet was interactive, before social media. And then for six years, and this is the period we'll talk the most about today, um, we were focused on um, addressing the narrative around favelas and supporting communities fighting eviction in the lead up to the Olympics. So uh, what we noticed in 2010 after a decade of work was that the favelas we supported in those first years who were doing all sorts of amazing projects in their communities, they actually were uh, being threatened with eviction for the Olympics. When we realized that, we realized we needed to step in and do something about this. And part of the reason they were being threatened was because the public thinks of favelas as a blight, thinks of favelas as slums. They don't differentiate between functioning, high, highly functional consolidated favelas and infor, you know, new um, precarious communities. Um, and so we thought it was really important just to work on this narrative for a while and support favelas resisting eviction and police violence. So we launched a website called Rio on Watch. It's bilingual, it's Portuguese and English, and you should all check it out. Um, and basically we, we share community perspectives in the lead up to the Olympics and beyond. Um, so those programs were part of our first two phases, the network building in the first decade and then communications. Now we're actually in a, just so you know, we're in a model development phase where our main activities are around creating sustainable models of how favelas can develop. Um, and then we'll move into more global advocacy and our organization is seen as having a life cycle, right? Where these different factors, networking, communications, model development and global advocacy sort of dance over time and some become more prominent. And we have four big projects today. 
um, Rio on Watch, which I mentioned, the Sustainable Favela Network, which is a network of favela sustainability projects, um, Favela Community Land Trust, which is about land titling through collective community land trusts, and Favela Unified, the COVID-19 and Favelas Unified Dashboard, which is around data gathering and crowdsourcing data on COVID-19 in favelas. And all of our programs are seen as cyclical working in, in together towards achieving the transformation that we see as necessary um, and also dialogue with the sustainable development goals. So there's a website where you can see more about that. Um, so again, before, I think this is the last slide before we go on to talk about the Olympic period, I will spend a second on this one because um, it's very important to everything we do as an organization and how we see favelas. Uh, we come from an asset-based community development framework. You can see on the slide on the right-hand side, which contrasts heavily with the traditional way that government programs work with low-income communities. So typically government programs focus on communities' problems, what they're deficient in. They look at them and say, okay, what are the problems? They bring in technical solutions. They see the community as somewhere, someone you're doing a favor for or charitable, you know, uh, a charitable service to, um, that the experts come in from outside and they provide the solutions, et cetera. Asset-based community development is the total opposite of that. We work with communities looking for the assets that they have already, the qualities they've developed. Then we identify opportunities for addressing their challenges based on that, using the assets that we find. Um, and we think of them, and we know, we, because in fact they are worthy of investment and deserving of rights rather than charitable cases. Um, and the solutions are devised in a mutual exchange, understanding that the experts are the residents. They're the ones who know what the needs are, what the potentials are, um, but with technical allies. So technical allies are there to serve and support the local needs um, and so on. So again, this slide is in the presentation you all have access to. So with all that background, um, I wanted to now focus on the, the heart of this talk which is the period of 10 years since uh, Brazil uh, was, you know, 11, 12 years now actually, or 11 and a half since um, Rio was selected to host the 2016 Olympics. Um, so much has been learned in that period. This is a picture of the uh, downtown of Rio during the largest protests um, in 2013. I think 300,000 people were in the streets against the government before the police became very violent. Um, and that's sort of a characteristic moment from that period. But just to sort of give you a huge overview of decades from 1975 to now in one slide, um, this is relating to the city and state of Rio specifically. Uh, before 2009 or 2008 or so, generally speaking, we had a 30 year period of economic stagnation in the state of Rio because the capital had moved to Brasilia from Rio and industry had moved to Sao Paulo. So Rio was gutted um, several decades before and it had stayed stagnant for decades. Um, there was very little immigration um, and very little political will and trust and cooperation. But then in, from that period, from about 20, 2008, 2009 through 2012, 13, right, vaguely this period, there was just a huge boom. You can see it in the photo, in the image in the top right of the real estate market in the city. It just exploded in those years. Um, Rio became the third largest economy in Brazil. Uh, it was receiving double the international investment of Sao Paulo. There was very strong political will and the governments were aligned, local, state and federal to make things happen. So with the hosting of the World Cup final and the Olympics, 20 to $30 billion were invested in the city and all of that money came in. And some of that was directed towards what were supposed to be programs to support the favelas. We saw climb decl crime decline in that period as well. Uh, inequality persisted, however. But then in the last seven, eight years now, we've had a huge bust. Everything soured again, an economic recession, which was nationwide took over, which actually has been worse in Rio than the rest of the country. There was an outmigration of people, widespread political corruption, right? Um, you know, protests with the World Cup, the Olympics, like the one I just showed, and inequality heightened. 
Um, so going back now to the glory days of the 2008 to 2012, you know, where things seem to be getting better. Um, in 2000, so, so coming back to the perspective of our organization, in 2009, when Rio was selected to host the Olympics, even we were excited at some level because we had been living a stagnant economy for 30 years. And the argument was that favelas didn't get investment because there was no money. So the idea that all these resources were going to come into the city was exciting to pretty much everybody in Rio. Um, but, you know, very quickly we, we saw things shift because our perspective at that point, we had built a big network of local organizers. And so we were hearing the official narrative. So these are all images of policies that were supposed to happen or were happening. Um, you know, we were going to get a humanized police force through the pacification police program, which was a uh, an attempt at reforming the police to make them less um, terrifying and 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 um, abusive. Uh, there was a plan to um, um, upgrade all of the favelas, bring them to, to standard infrastructure by 2020, which is this image in the top right. Uh, there were plans for libraries, 3D movie theaters, public housing, uh, funicular trams and gondolas. Um, and all of these things sounded quite promising, but we were seeing something really different. So these are images that we took within our work. So this was visiting favelas and participating in different things that were happening at the time. There were forced evictions happening. There were those massive police abuse, even among the pacifying police units. Public housing that was being built for people who were evicted was quickly being torn down because of the low quality of the building materials and, and, and um, style. And the government was keeping people out of meetings that were determining their futures. That's what the, me, me, the photo is in the middle. These are residents trying to get into a pro closed door meeting where their future is being determined by the mayor. So what we saw in that period was again, um, the official narrative what the government said they were going to upgrade all the favelas, bring in this nice policing, bring in resources, and we were seeing the opposite. Um, and what we were seeing really was a massive rebranding exercise. The city of Rio, you know, just as ESPN was putting out this article, Deadly Games, about the, 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 the safety issues for the Olympics, you get um, uh, the state of Rio taking out a nine page spread in Foreign Policy magazine. Uh, you know, one year apart, this was the front cover of the America section of the New York Times. You have the police um, uh, violence, and then you have the police holding babies. This was the, kind, the same author. So these are the kind of changes in image that we were seeing. And it wasn't an accident. The city of Rio was spending massive amounts of money on um, marketing. You can see the planned budget for marketing in blue and that chart on the left and the actual marketing budget in red. And you see all the different major events that were happening in Rio over that period that made it very exciting to be there and invest, et cetera. Um, and the city opened a website, web portal to facilitate investment from international donors. The Economist proclaimed it, you know, taking off, et cetera. So we had a period where all of this was happening well, what happened then? So Rio went from being 23rd most expensive city in the world in 2011, which is this image in the top left, which was already a huge jump from previous years. But by 2014, it was actually the 11th most expensive city in the world. Now imagine that in a developing country with the stark inequality that we have. Um, and then if you looked at the number in the bottom right that's circled, right, that's the change in expense of living um, from 2008 to 2014. So it was a six year period, Rio had an 86% increase in cost of living, um, which was the highest in the world in that period. So imagine what's gonna happen to the favelas, right? What's gonna happen um, in this context? Um, at the same time, we had people making a lot of money or hoping to make a lot of money off of this, like this real estate tycoon um, and then we saw the evictions, right? So there were 80,000 people were evicted from their homes in the lead up to the Olympics. Um, and these were people who for the most part were in consolidated favelas, not new slums, but consolidated favelas. This was Favela do Metro. I had the opportunity to be there a lot throughout the eviction process before, during and after. So I got to know it. 
um, unfortunately they were, uh, the reporting came out very late there, it wasn't really influential in the outcome. Um, and uh, residents were ultimately evicted through a process where the government uh, uh, came in and identified the family, the people who were most vulnerable, most scared, got them to, to leave immediately and then took advantage that that it was about a seventh of the community, about 100 out of 700 households. Once they left, they went bulldozing those homes and leaving debris and making the community inhospitable for the other residents who decided to fight the eviction, but now we're fighting it amongst debris in a very um, unsafe environment. So this is Tanki. This is an example of another community where the government came in pretty much overnight and told people they had to leave. And these are just a couple of examples, but this, these maps, these are three different maps by um, different university researchers showing the same thing, which is the massive um, eviction of people from central and south zones, which are basically where most of the people live, where the jobs are concentrated uh, and where the real estate is most valuable, moving from those favelas to two hours away in the west part of the city. And Villa Autodromo is a particularly symbolic case of what happens when we don't see favela assets, right? We don't see the qualities that these communities have. You can see in the picture in the top left, this was actually a well-built community. The houses were fairly large um, with good lots. Often they had yards, they had trees, um, they had wide roads. It would not have been hard to upgrade the roads, the infrastructure, because it was spacious and it wasn't too dense. Um, the young people there tend to go to university because people who live in this favela were often people from other favelas who found it and realized it was a very safe community where they could build a life. So people there tended to want to stay there. They, they moved there expecting to grow old and die there. And um, so people don't know the story of Villa Autodromo. So to the public, this was just a favela that was next to the Olympic site that needed to be removed because it would be a blight. But the reality is that it wasn't. Um, and it was a very livable community with a strong sense of unity around the, the desire to stay. But the government just hammered at them over years, um, identifying residents, putting people against each other, figuring out how they could uh, sway the community enough. Um, and there was violence at one point. This is Donna Pena and the bloody face in the bottom right. She um, is like a petite, slim woman, um, very committed to her faith. Uh, not a risk to anyone, um, and yet she got a bloody face in one of these altercations. Um, in the end, she and 19 other families were able to stay because of their resistance in these little houses that are built on the site, these little white houses in the bottom right. So a community of 700, 800 families on the, the top left was transformed into um, a rebuilt uh, community of 20 homes, and those who stayed were the ones who they founded an evictions museum and they commit their lives to telling the story of this eviction. So if you ever go to Rio, you should visit the evictions museum. Um, so again, there was the eviction part and there was also gentrification. And if favelas were such a bad place, why would they gentrify, right? So this is just a very basic question. Um, but this is an image from Financial Times newspaper uh, where they actually published a buying guide comparing investing in um, buying houses in the favela Vigigal for 100,000 pounds to what you'd get in Ipanema or Copacabana, which are upscale beachfront neighborhoods nearby. Um, so you can see there was actually a significant process of gentrification in the favela Vigigal. Again, this is the image I showed earlier. You can see it better here. It just shows the bubble the boom and bust cycle that Rio went through. Um, and then of course came the bust. Uh, so we had major, we've had major austerity now for the last five years um, and you know recession and so on. This is before the pandemic. This, things are much worse now, unfortunately. Rio is a case study of, first of all, what happens when you don't deal with your historic inequalities. And second, that if things can get, if you think things can't get worse, they can. So you need to stay engaged in changing them and maintaining what you value. Um, so again, um, you know, there were some years of crime reduction um, and, and so on. 
And of course we have the, the president who was elected, the Brazilian president who was elected, who um, has been, uh, to be honest, he's been happy to take advantage of COVID to, um, to, do, to impart harm on the populations that he has always wanted to um, do away with. So uh, we're living a very, very complicated, sad situation. Um, in terms of COVID, just bringing this a little more up to date, uh, when we started the pandemic, there was already severe un under reporting. Um, and now it continues. These are some images from the beginning of the pandemic when um, we couldn't find data on favelas that were being impacted by COVID and the reach of COVID in these communities. So uh, we started identifying community sources and there were several favelas where people were either going door to door to ask or they were counting at a local community center or they were um, counting from a local clinic. Um, but it was important to start that counting process. Now we know that obviously all favelas have now been impacted by COVID uh, and the, the numbers are um, disproportionately high relative to the rest of the city. Um, you know, and 80% of favela families have actually, are actually living on less than half of their pre-pandemic income. So in terms of, you know, looking at that period, this, this decade I just described um, in very broad strokes, which we can go into more detail when um, in the Q&A, uh, I just wanted to share something a bit more uplifting, which is the learning that comes from going through something like this. There was this expectation that the 20, 30 billion dollars invested for the Olympics would benefit favela communities early on. Um, there was this uh, a naive understanding on all of our parts that the government having that kind of money, the favelas would finally be benefited. But the reality is that almost no favelas had any upgrading of their infrastructure in that period. The infrastructure projects that happened were for tourism, like the gondolas, which were closed down when the Olympics were over. Um, the community policing program also has been dismantled uh, because it became essentially um, a a copy of the current, the traditional police, um, even though it started off a little bit better than that. Um, and so we've had this process. Now, there's a reaction to that, of course. So as communities realize, gosh, not only are we not getting invested in, but we're not, um, uh, but we're being evicted from our homes. Our commute times are increasing because of that, even though they built, uh, bus rapid transit systems, they took out all the traditional, many of the traditional bus lines. And so for many people in favelas, commutes increased, especially if they were evicted to far away. Uh, so what do we learn from this? And there are basically seven keys to successful resistance against evictions that we identified, but they're also useful um, in general around favela organizing and probably apply to cities around the world. So. Um, with regard to evictions, we saw this very clear lineup, right? The first and most important key for the, oh, I should mention, there were 80,000 evictions in the pre-Olympic period, but um, many favelas were not evicted. There were favelas that fought eviction successfully, right? And so we take our lessons here from both the favelas who fought successfully against and stopped evictions, but also the favelas that got better outcomes through fighting, right? They would have had a much worse, maybe they would have been evicted to two, two, to two hours away. Instead, they were evicted to five minutes away. Maybe they were evicted to better housing. Maybe they got better compensation. So these keys to successful resistance are sort of weighted in accordance with those that understanding. And the first and most important is unity. Unity in the commitment to stay. <clears throat> it's not necessarily unity where the community all gets along but it's unity in the sense that everybody there really wants to stay there. They value that community. That is number one. Um, if that is shared by 100% of residents, it's pretty much impossible for the government to evict them. Um, what the government tends to do is find those 10% or whatever percent are not committed to staying and then mine away at the rest. Um, access to information. So knowing that they have rights at all, right? That they can protest, that they can call the public defenders to get legal defense. These are in access to information, how to learning from other communities that have been evicted, um, how they would prevent it. The third is legal defense. So uh, this at the very least buys time, if not actually provides a successful resistance. So uh, we do in Rio have an incredible institution, which is the State Public Defender's 
uh, office is housing and land rights department. So within this public defenders, um, there are lawyers who are paid to provide legal support to favelas around evictions. And so when residents know about this, then they can seek out these resources and get legal defense. The fourth is diverse, resolute leadership. So the more different leaders a favela has with different backgrounds um, and, and that are mutually supporting, right, the movement, the better. Um, the fifth is broad networks of support. So, you know, as many different organizations as possible, you know, other, other communities that are resisting, uh, you know, uh, communities of faith, uh, universities, journalists, anybody, human rights organizations, anybody they can get that will provide, provide reinforcement and support for them. And then sixth is creative responses. So interesting responses where they think of something that's aligned specifically with their community and their approach. Um, and then finally, early and ongoing nuanced visibility. Uh, this isn't a one-time news article, that's helpful for sure. But if a community can get ongoing coverage, and this is really where Rian Watch stepped in, we provided that ongoing visibility. So people who wanted to follow what was happening in a specific favela, they could. And it allowed the favela, whenever there was a change of plans by the mayor or anything towards that favela, we could publish it and it would provide a timeline um, so that journalists who don't have as much time to fully understand a story, they can quickly see that, okay, this is what the city's done and report on it. So facilitating that kind of work. So going a couple slide, slides to show each of these. Um, so number one, unity. Uh, this image in the top right is a favela that cleaned up an area that was a huge trash dump um, where the city had demolished houses a decade, couple decades ago. They had left the, de the debris. The community had used it as a trash dump after that. A group of residents got together, cleaned it up and transformed it into an urban oasis. Um, the bottom left is a picture of uh, the Stop Killing Us movement, um, responding to um, police violence against black youth. These are all, these women here are all mothers who have lost their children to police violence and they're holding up the signs. Um, the top left is where residents, so, so not, not only were residents of the community of Villa Union fighting eviction uh, in the meeting, but there were in this picture, there are people from three other favelas that have been fighting eviction. So you have this unity across favelas, right? Um, again, here's the picture of that park. And here's the picture of the Stop Killing Us protest. So this is actually a protest that united about 80 different community organizations across the city around, um, around Black, essentially Black Lives Matter themes. The Sustainable Favela Network, which is another project of ours, is also an example of unity, right? Uh, um, outside of, resist, of eviction, but in, in, in building movements. So number two is access to information. Uh, these are some pictures of critical tools in that sense. The picture in the top left is of a brochure that's distributed in favelas to teach residents how to film police violence. The film on the top right is a woman in a favela um, who's actually protesting not wanting a, she's saying in, in this particular image, she's screaming that she does not want land titles, which is a really interesting, she understood that the government was trying to bring land titles in her community that was a highly gentrifying area, right at that moment meant that they were basically gonna open the floodgates to speculation and she wouldn't be able to stay there and afford her community. So she had enough information to understand that that's what would happen um, and protest against it. The bottom left is a couple that a thought that remained um, when all of their neighbors basically had succumbed to city pressure for eviction. Uh, they didn't because they have a special needs child and they built their favela house, designed it for this child. And they weren't, the compensation the government was offering them was 5,000 reais, that's about the equivalent of 1,000 US dollars now, um, which of course wouldn't allow them to do anything in the 11th most expensive city in the world at the time. And so they fought and fought and um, thanks to media outlets and them knowing, first of all, them knowing their rights, but also uh, the presence of visibility of media, they were able to increase their compensation ten, um, fivefold, fivefold, yeah, five, no, sorry, tenfold over the course of two days. 
Um, so it makes a huge difference. This picture in the bottom right is of the community of Vijigao having public debates about gentrification, sort of introducing what is gentrification. This was when gentrification was a brand new word in Portuguese uh, in 2012, 2013. And um, so it was important that people in favelas that were prone to gentrification near the beaches and so on, um, people knew what this was so they would make informed decisions about what they wanted to do. Again, this is the picture of the woman saying she doesn't want title. This is the um, uh, brochure showing how to film police violence safely. Um, and also during the pandemic, adding to the information, right, a lot of community organizations and movements have gone online and created events. They call them lives. Um, you know, the idea is after live stream, but actually it's just any event online that's public is called a live. And this was a series done by the Sustainable Favela Network last year on a series of themes. Um, and these are events that were our organization held in Vijigao around gentrification back in 2012 to help local leaders understand what it was, which led them to create the public debates in the heart of the community and also led us to start the Community Land Trust Project. Um, and again, back to information, then we've got the issue now around COVID data, right? So information is absolutely critical and that's what's led us to start the dashboard. So uh, number three is legal defense. So these communities have the right to legal defense. I mentioned the public defender's office, but many residents don't realize this, uh, but it's been absolutely critical for um, maintaining favelas intact, for delaying evictions, for uh, helping communities understand their rights. Uh, fourth is broad networks of support. So this is just some examples um, where you have everything from Amnesty International here on the bottom right around police fight, we're doing an installation around police violence to the bottom left where it's a movement that's mostly by young students, universities um, against uh, World Cup evictions. Um, you know, the public defender's office, you know, uh, community movements, uh, public figures um, and celebrities, community or, you know, based groups. So all of these groups together working to change outcomes. Um, this is an example of, within this broad networks of support. During, in 2012, Raquel Honik, who at the time was the special rapporteur to the UN on adequate housing, she actually wrote a piece on her blog talking about how favelas should be considered part of the UNESCO World Heritage Landscape designation that had been given to Rio. And again, focusing on, you know, diverse, um, sorry, diverse networks of support, uh, the COVID-19 in Favela's dashboard is a group of 20 community-based organizations, but plus um, uh, organizations working on um, uh, the National Health Foundation, for example, and so on, all working together uh, to promote, um, COVID-19 prevention in favelas. So number five is diverse and resolute leadership. And for this, I just like to show Vila Autodromo's leaders. Vila Autodromo had at least six, if not 10, um, very strong local leaders that helped uh, in their resistance campaigns. And they were, each one had a different personality approach, audience, and the fact that they were all working together um, was uh, absolute, cr absolutely critical in their ultimate outcome. And then also in terms of diverse, uh, resolute leadership, you know, you can you can see organizations um, that 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 operate with you know multiple um, multiple types of uh, organizers involved. Um, this is a group called that works on agroforestry, uh, but they also work on nutrition and they also work on community development and in education and environmental education before the pandemic in the favela of Peña. And this is what they've been doing during the pandemic, right? So this idea of sort of, okay, we're gonna be committed to this no matter what. Okay, the pandemic comes, we're gonna stop with all the work we were doing and we're gonna shift gears and now we're gonna make sure people get food su supplies. The same thing happened in this group in the West Zone of Rio and hundreds of others across the city throughout the pandemic and the lack of government response. Um, you have community organization that have this beautiful, huge space where all sorts of things happened during the pandemic totally focused on food distribution campaigns. Um, so that resolute leadership, right? We're gonna stick to this. We're gonna stick to our community no matter what. And in terms of key number six, creative responses, this is the one I most like to talk about because it's so interesting. Um, 
you know, basically it's what is unique to your favela. And this is why I like it so much because when communities create creative responses, they're always building on their assets intuitively. It's what can we do to respond to our, the threat, right? What fits the threat and fits our community? So for example, the top left here is the Ohto community, which was marked for eviction um, in the lead up to the Olympics for by the Botanical Gardens anyway, which is next door. Um, this community has actually been there for longer than the first favela. It's a 200 year old community because it was first settled by people who helped build the botanical gardens when they were given permission to be there. Um, but it was all informal. Anyway, they were attacked in the local media by, the, by Global, which has its headquarters in the same neighborhood and didn't want them there. Um, and it was said that they were invaders of the land, recent invaders of the land. So what did Ohtu do? They created a museum. And in that museum, they show the history of the community going back 200 years. They show documentation. They created an online and face-to-face -face museum. Um, or you have the top right, which was when the city of Rio closed a bunch of its buses uh, in the pre-Olympic period. I mentioned that the bus system, um, some of it was dismantled. So the, the buses that used to bring people from the low-income north zone to the beaches, so people from the favelas in the North Zone would come to the beaches on the weekend. Those were cut off so that people would only come to the South Zone if they had a job and they'd have to take two or three buses and it would make it hard for them. It was a way of segregating the city. So what did they do? Re local residents organized um, uh, trucks that would bring people to the beaches on weekends and they'd have a huge barbecue camp out on the beach. Um, you know, so all of these are different strategies. The bottom right is Bilal Tadramu again, the favela evicted for the Olympics, the, the most notable, well-known one, I should say. Um, they came up with a popular plan. They worked with urban planners. When the mayor said, oh, I can't upgrade your community. You're right next to the Olympics. It's a blight. They said, well, we're going to create a plan. And the mayor had a plan, which is basically to remove them. And they said, we, we're going to make our own plan. So they worked with the universities. They had all sorts of public meetings. And they came up with a plan that would have cost 14 million reais to redo the whole neighborhood, to clean, do the streets, the sewage, a daycare center, improve the housing. The city ended up spending 300 million to evict the residents from that community. And other creative responses, the sustainable favela network map to show that there are favelas that are developing sustainability projects. And this is um, Otavio in the bottom left here. He's responsible for what will be the cleanest sewage in the whole city of Rio in a little favela in the forest um, that they've built themselves um, through uh, accessible technology, through biodigesters. Um, and you know, this is an example of a community fighting eviction through photography. So a local photographer took pictures of families that or people that were threatened with eviction and plastered them big on the walls of their homes and did a big campaign to show that if the bulldozers come in here, it's gonna knock these people right out. It's gonna be this visual scene and created a um, pressure on the city and they actually didn't evict this area of the community. Now he did a similar thing with the Portuguese sculptor Vils, uh, who's a famous sculptor from Portugal who came to Brazil to work with him to sculpt out of the sides of the homes that were demolished the faces of the people who used to live in those homes. And these two images are in Providencia. Again, that was the very first favela settled over 120 years ago. Um, so, you know, again, there are more and more cases of, of this sort of creative responses. Um, there's a lot around police violence, how to film, um, websites and apps to report police violence. There's the evictions museum I mentioned earlier, which is another creative response of how do we keep the memories alive so this doesn't happen again, which is related to the favela museums and memory guide, which and memories guide, which was published um, last year by the sustainable favela network, which shows 26 local museums. So think about this. If 26 favelas have decided we need to record our history in a museum, what does that say about the permanence of these you know, so-called slums, right? Um, they're definitely not slums if people want not only to stay, but they recognize the history of that community is valuable enough to create efforts to memorialize them. Um, solutions from the favelas, you know, in the pandemic have been incredible. 
uh, creative responses as well. There's one example here of uh, people building um, uh, building sinks in public spaces uh, in a community where there wasn't enough access to water. Uh, and then finally, key number seven, early and ongoing nuanced and growing visibility. I mentioned this was a big focus of Rio and Watch, which is our publication in that period. Um, but it's important to note that, you know, it was only the first time race started being talked about in Brazil at a high scale was in the pre-Olympic period when the international media was in Rio and they said, my goodness, look at this obvious situation that's linked to racial uh, racial justice, right? The inequality in Rio, which honestly, people in Rio weren't thinking about race as the main factor for the most part. And it took foreign journalists coming in um, to, to, see, to bring that lens. So there's some positive things you could say come out of that Olympic spotlight. Um, and enter social media. And this is, I think, the biggest thing when it comes to visibility. We've had just over the last decade, one after the other community organization, community news outlet. Um, and if you probably put there's so basically there are dozens, if not hundreds of community newspapers and community news outlets um, representing different favelas. And if you put all these together, you probably ha would have a higher circulation than the local daily newspaper. Um, you know, we published Olympics resources for journalists on our website to get journalists to think more critically about their reporting and be more careful. We also have an annual best worst reporting of favelas editorial that we publish. Um, and we did a survey looking at how the media um, changed their reporting on favelas in that eight year period. Um, and it, many things significantly improved. Um, generally speaking, favelas were spoken about with more nuance, uh, more residents were voiced than before um, and significantly more, um, and um, that we also showed a huge difference between community journalists who reported and international journalists in terms of the quality of coverage of favelas. And that led us to do some meetups. So this is a picture before the pandemic. Um, and in this room, there's a mix of literally the correspondent for The Guardian, for The New York Times, uh, for The Washington Post, um, for I think a, a major German newspaper, um, French newspaper are all in this room, um, along with community journalists from about a dozen favelas. And they're all talking about journalism and, and, and how reporting on favelas happens. So this kind of these conversations to improve the discourse, right? Um, this is about a local community uh, news outlet in Rio, uh, which has been critical in documenting police abuse. And again, if favelas um, are, we, if we think of them as slums, right, why would they be gentrifying? And again, um, the importance of international reporting on race. These articles are definitely worth reading. Brazil's Color Bind came out of Globe and Mail in Canada is one of the best pieces I've seen in English on race in Brazil. Um, and just finishing up this section, and, and before we conclude the talk, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know, give this example. So I mentioned very quickly earlier, the community Metro Mangueira, which was evicted for the Olympics and how it took months for the media to report on it. And they were really unable to influence anything. Well, that was in 2010. By 2016 or 2015, we had a major shift. This image, these articles from 2015, um, by 2015, thanks to all those community sources and community journalists and their work, um, there was, uh, it was people, and of course, social media and, and access to smartphones, that whole combination of factors, people started recording. So this image in the top left is a, was filmed by a woman in her house, putting her phone out the window, and she was able to capture police framing a young man for, um, before they murdered him and murdering him. Um, and she was able to get that on out and within an hour, it was all over the community social media feeds and within a couple of hours on the local news. And by the next morning, the next day, it was on the Guardian and other international outlets. So there was a huge shift in that Olympic period, which was also due to technology and smartphones, but mostly due to community organizing and around, um, around you know, community media production, there was this shift where people knew their rights, they were filming and 
information was flowing much quicker. And the Guardian, to their to their credit, actually had um, several community journalists from favelas reporting over a period of months about the impact of the Olympics. Um, and this is just bringing this up to date, this section on, on news. This is a series that we now, two series that we now are featuring on Rio and Watch. And we've launched a podcast, which is a little slow in English, but it'll pick up speed. Um, but one is on anti-racism in favelas and the other one is on energy justice in favelas. Um, so, you know, this, I, this focus on bringing visibility to issues con continues throughout our work and all of these local partners. So to conclude, um, and then here are all of your thoughts. You know, I mentioned earlier that you know, I've mentioned multiple times 80,000 people were evicted from their homes for this period from consolidated communities at great cost. And we saw gentrification of favelas. And this was because of our inability to see favelas for their qualities. Um, you know, we need to drop the double standards. Um, I'm an urban planner and within my field, there are all sorts of trendy things that pop up that favelas have been doing for a hundred years. There's tactical urbanism, which is when people take control of the urban space, you know, in an unregulated way. Uh, there's maker spaces and hacking. This is how favelas operate. The, there's also a trend around risky playgrounds that are good for kids because they create more challenging environments, right? These are all double standards. Favelas have all of these qualities. Um, they're comprised, but it's different when people don't choose it. They do it out of need. It's different when people are low income and they're marginalized. They're treated differently for doing the same thing. Um, and then just a final reflection is that all the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, uh, historic sites were built before regulated building. They were built, they were favelas. Um, they're rec recognized, for example, Valparaiso in Chile, but this could apply to many of the ones in Europe. They're recognized for their vernacular urban fabric, right? Their improvised urban design. And so we need to really drop those double standards and recognize that informality is the way informal uh, informal development is the way cities evolved for all of human history until the last couple of hundred years. So, again, to conclude, what if Rio embraced the unique history of each of the city's favelas, recognized their contribution to the city, and actually supported their future development in ways that honored resident knowledge and history? What if we invested in decentralized city planning where communities control their destiny and technical allies support their vision. And finally, what if Rio and other cities with consolidated informal settlements could set an example for the world, realizing community-led integration that's rooted in community assets and benefits from what are actually qualities of informality. And again, a third of human, um, of, of people will be living in informal settlements by 2050. So we need models for that. And in terms of what's next for us, again, I'm not going to go through all these details, but we have a lot going on. Um, and it would be great to have any of you who are interested in these programs reach out. I'll share my email in the chat. We have a digest, which is a news, uh, an email we send out every two weeks with all the latest news in English on favelas, both on our website, but also across the internet, across news sites. It's very easy to sign up. You just go to the link at the top there, catcom.org slash sign up, um, and you can get the di digest every two weeks. Um, we have a very strong privacy policy, so we'll never share your email or anything like that. Um, also, we have internships, virtual internships. If any of you want to intern with our organization, um, please reach out and social media and donations are welcome. Uh, so I will switch off the slides here now and um, hope to hear from the audience.